first relationship in this diagram that we're going to take a look at is theorem 2.11, which shows us that if we happen to know that a sequence is convergent, that will imply that the sequence is also bounded. Uh, and one of the other things I'm going to be asking you to do on this diagram is also think about whether or in what cases the converse might also be true. But let's just, for starters, think about the implication going in this direction. This is theorem 2.11. Every convergent sequence is necessarily bounded. So here is a diagram visualizing a convergent sequence. Right, the, the terms of the sequence are settling down upon some number. Since this is a convergent sequence, uh, we know that any epsilon that the universe chooses for us, any positive epsilon, will have the property, no matter how small epsilon is chosen, that eventually this sequence will enter the little strip that's within an epsilon distance of its limit, and it will remain within that strip for the rest of time. So in this example, epsilon is playing the role of this little half diameter, I guess it's a radius. So any epsilon that we choose, that the universe chooses, sorry, there will be a capital N such that every single term of the sequence after that capital N will lie within this strip. So maybe my capital N is right here. So after the nth term, all the terms of the sequence which are past that, all Sn for n greater than or equal to n, are within epsilon of the limit. And so when we first started talking about this definition, what we introduced a little bit of terminology um, that I want to bring to the fore uh, again in this proof, because I think it helps us to think about what's happening. This capital N splits our sequence into two parts. It splits it into a head, all the terms leading up to S sub capital N, and it splits it into a tail. These are all infinitely many terms of the sequence uh, for n greater than or equal to capital N. So the tail terms are Sn plus 1, Sn plus 2, Sn plus 3, and so on and so on, out to infinity. And the head is S1, S2, up to Sn. And so the question that we have for this proof is how do I know that this entire sequence is bounded? How do I know that I can find a ceiling and a floor, by assumption, right, that will work for every single term of the sequence? Let's start with the tail. How do I know that the tail of this sequence is going to be bounded? Label the, uh, the dotted lines on this diagram here just a little bit. So these dotted lines are between L plus epsilon and L minus epsilon, where L is the limit of the sequence and the epsilon is the epsilon that the universe has chosen for us. Um, so based on this diagram, uh, how do I know what a bound might be, an upper bound, for the tail of the sequence? A single one of the terms of this tail of the sequence are less than or equal to L plus epsilon. So it kind of seems as though we can get an upper bound for this tail. There's a little bit of a sign problem we have to overcome in a second here, but we'll, we'll worry about that as a second order concern. An upper bound for the tail will be L plus epsilon. And the tail is going to be the harder of these two pieces to bound because there are infinitely many terms in that tail. So we've just used the definition of convergence to get us a statement which is universally true of all the infinitely many terms in the tail of this sequence. Um, so that's super powerful. Right? That's actually the harder part of this proof. What about the head? Where am I going to get a bound, an upper bound, for the head of this sequence? This picture, it looks like the very first term of the sequence is the largest of all the terms in the head of the sequence. Right? Of all capital N terms in the head of the sequence, S1 is the largest of them. Um, how would our reasoning change? if our sequence looked a little bit different. So maybe instead of S1 being the biggest, maybe I have some other term that ends up being bigger. <coughs> how would I convey to the reader how to choose the upper bound for the head of the sequence without knowing which one of these n terms is the largest? What could I say? 
What was important about S1 is that it had the largest absolute value right, of all the capital N terms of the sequence in the head. And so an upper bound for the head of this sequence is just going to be the largest of the absolute values of the SNs among these n terms. So I'm going to write it like this. Max of the absolute value of S1, comma, dot, 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 absolute value of Sn. So S, S capital N, sorry. So all capital N terms in the head of the sequence are going to have some absolute value for their value. And then we just take the largest of those. And that forms for us an upper bound for the head of the sequence. So my subsequent question is, well, why couldn't we have done the same thing for the tail? Why couldn't I just write, take the max of all of the values, absolute values, of the terms in the tail? How come we could do that for the head, but we can't do that for the tail? The difference is that the head of the sequence is always a finite set. And because it's a finite set, we know that the max will always exist. It, and it will be equal to one of those values. Right? Any finite set has a max. Some infinite sets don't because they can have unboundedness happening, because they could be, I don't know, constantly increasing to a limit that they might not actually attain. Right? Um, so infinite sets might not have maxes. Finite sets always do. Okay? And so that's how we get away with this. And then the last thing I'm going to comment about this, and then I'll finish up the details uh, in a video I'll post to our stream after class today. Once I have the max for the head and also the upper bound for the tail, how do I get an upper bound for the entire sequence? In this example, it looks like the, the max of the head was right here. The max of the tail is right there. How do I decide how to get an upper bound for my whole sequence from that? Whichever, one's greater. Whichever one is bigger. Right. Whichever ceiling is higher between the ceiling for the head and the ceiling for the tail, that will give us a ceiling for the whole sequence. So that's the logic that's going to go into this proof. Um, and I'll show you in the video, uh, in five seconds, in the video, uh, how that all pans out. <laughs>